So I work at the New York Public Library. And if you've never been, this is uh, the building I work in. This is my office. It's a very nice um, building. But the, the, the library, the New York Public Library, is really a collection of 90 buildings across three neighborhoods in Manhattan, in, in New York City, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island. When the New York Public Library was founded, Queens and Brooklyn were cities and they had their own library system. So the, the, the only New York City didn't have a library system. So, so we cover those three boroughs, but we serve any New Yorker with any library card and borrow. So this is a, a, a research uh, building. The, the, the New York Public Library has 90 buildings, 90 libraries, but four of them our research. This is a humanities research uh, building. It is more famous for the movie Ghostbusters or <laughs> Sex and the City, right? If you've seen that. And if you look inside that building, there are, you know, of course, books, lots of books in this library, this uh, several uh, levels of, of books. And in the top floor, there is the, the reading room where, where you actually get to read the books. Uh, but we also have other types of collections. We have um, a manuscripts and, and archives division where we hold many valuable items from the uh, from U.S. history and around the world. Uh, we have a um, um, genealogy division where we have uh, phone books and city directories and genealogical information from uh, hundreds of years ago. We, of course, have a map room where you can uh, browse any of our hundreds of thousands of, of, of atlases and books that we have. You know, this is you know, what an atlas looks like. You're probably familiar with that. You know, lots of books. Um, but we also have poster-type maps, right, with incomplete continents. And we have uh, maps from explorers. European, when they arrived in, in America, they started mapping as they went through colonizing. Uh, we also have a, a projected maps, like this is a, on the left was a Manhattan as it was constructed so far in the early 19th century, and the, this is the, the map that projects the, the, the growth of the city over the next hundreds of years. So it is, it is a very um, well-known map, the, the one that established the, the famous New York City grid. We have maps that were drawn from, from balloons, and like perspective maps. And of course, we have globes. This is the earliest known uh, uh, depiction of America in a, in a globe uh, from the 1500. Uh, it only has South America. Back in that day, they, they still haven't made it up to North America. There are European cities. So we are in the process. So to see these maps, you still need to go to New York to see them, right? You need to be in this physical room. Uh, anybody can go, but it is free. But but you need to be in New York. So so only a few people benefit from this privilege. We of course have a, a digitization um, unit where high resolution photographs of of our collections are taken, and then you can post them. And we can post them on our website, so anybody from Japan or from wherever in the world that has internet access can access these uh, materials. Uh, recently, many of our maps are, are so old that copyright does not apply to them, so they are public domain. So we re release the high-resolution version of these atlases so that people can do whatever they want with them. 
Uh, this is a, a, a news from two years ago when this happened. So it's about 20,000 maps that you can download and you can use them in your uh, journalist practice, right? You, you can use it to uh, add to your literature project or you can, if you have a band, you can do a flyer and put the map in the flyer to promote the next show. Or if you're an artist, this is a commissioned work. You, you, we, this is an artist that does a collage with Google uh, Earth. But the, Jenny Odell, she was commissioned by the library to produce some artwork out of the uh, public domain maps. And she took the um, decorative elements of the maps and uh, grouped them in, in three different paintings that are being exhibited at the library. So one is about uh, people, the other one is about gods, and the other one is about animals. But what we want to do, uh, or uh, uh, in, in addition to enabling the creation of new culture, like I showed you before, we want to have our maps, we have this collection of atlases, we want to have this map be able to answer a question like we do with present day Google Maps, right? That the, the, the geographic data is embedded in the map and you can ask uh, interesting questions like, for example, where is the Joe's Pizza in Carmine, right? When you ask Google, it tells you it's over there, right? It's here. So basically, what we do, what is happening is translating human language into computer language, right? We would like to do that with our maps. So, but what if this were possible for the past? Not only for the present, Google and OpenStreetMap deal with the present day. Uh, because, for example, this, we, we have, this is a, a regular screen, a, a, a corner in, in, in Manhattan, right? But people don't know that around this corner there was this famous tavern where intellectuals met in the mid 19th century to talk about. Uh, politics and literature and uh, this place was located in this corner or you wouldn't know from this from looking at this random building somewhere in Manhattan that in that building uh, one of the most important Broadway musicals was created uh, and even some architectural elements of the building still exist or even our own uh, office this building that was built in 1911. Uh, this is how it looked like in 1931. No, not many skyscrapers back then. But if you go even further back, it used to be a water reservoir, right? Uh, to have fresh water for the city of New York in the day. And you can even see parts of the water reservoir from my office, right? It, it's it's there. there, there's evidence of, of the presence of that water reservoir hundreds of years before. Uh, so this is something similar to what projects like, like History Pin try to do, that, that let you add, uh, annotate uh, historical images in geographic areas. Or this is a, a project by Dan Vanderkam uh, in collaboration with the library where he took some of our uh, photographs that we had uh, cataloged and he geolocated them in the present day map. But wouldn't it be great if we could show these images in the map from the day they were taken? Among our collections, the, the more, one of the most interesting uh, atlas set, set of atlases that we have is this insurance, uh, fire insurance atlases. It is kind of like Zenrin company, but in the 19th century, right? So they, they went all over the United States drawing these maps for every city that had 2,000 people or more. So almost all of the United States was mapped um, in very high detail. You can see um, addresses, you can see street names, you can see the color tells you something. These dots mean the material is high quality or low quality. These are fire insurance, so in case there was a fire, you would get a, 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 a compensated in proportion to whatever you have. But to calculate the compensation, you need to know what type of 
and material the building is made. So we have the year, we have street names, we have use type, uh, name of the building, sometimes we know if it's a shop or a church, and the material of the building, the class of material, address number, you know, stories, skylights, backyard, you know, geolocation, and of course the shape of the building itself. So it's a very rich data set. And, and this is, you know, how it looks right now. Uh, so it's just an image, it's just a photograph of the map. It doesn't really tell you any geographic information. Right? When, when, when we see it in the website, it's just an image. You cannot ask geographic questions. Maybe this is some, you know, but, but maybe this street is not here. So you cannot find that street in that map, right? Um, so we built, um, in collaboration with, with uh, these partners, to, uh, a website that would allow staff and volunteers to add geographic information to, to the map, right, to the, to the image. So the, 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 the URL is maps.nypl.org. And basically, it, it goes like this. You, you are familiar with this projection, Mercator, Web Mercator. And we have a photograph we take of the, of the map, of the atlas, right? It's a normal JPEG. And there is some mathematical magic that transforms the, the, the image into an accurate uh, projection in, in, that you can use in OpenStreetMap, for example. Uh, so this image becomes something like this, right? Now you can start asking more interesting geographic questions to this to this uh, sheet, uh, but you don't know if the, you 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 don't know what buildings are in the sheet. You just know that this is the boundary of the sheet. You don't really know what buildings are in there, but it is one step forward. And when you add many sheets like this, uh, you get a more complete uh, version of, of, of Manhattan that is geographically um, uh, aware. And you can overlay that in, in, for example, Google Earth if you export it from the map worker. And by hand, we've been extracting building level data uh, so that now you can, you know, e extract the, the have more fine-grained, more high-resolution information about the map itself, so you know if a given building is present in the map or not, or how has it changed. Uh, right? So this data is, for example, being used by the city of New York when Hurricane Sandy uh, came in 2012. It flooded uh, a good portion of Manhattan. So by, by looking at the, at the historical maps that we have, uh, and, and looking at the uh, city boundary, the island boundaries in those times, you can see that the, the, the parts that were flooded are the parts that have been constructed uh, by humans over time. Uh, or this is a project by uh, this researcher who, who was mapping cholera, a cholera epidemic in the early 19th century using our, our atlases, our historical maps. Right? And they could point the problem of cholera to a, to a water pond that was very contaminated back in those days. Or you can do a nice t-shirt also. Right? It's just... But this is a very laborious process, right? You, by hand, drawing all these little buildings, it takes forever. So you get an idea that that, that set of, of buildings are about 60 thousand buildings, so you need to draw those by hand, and it will take forever because we have atlases for many decades, so it, we have millions of buildings to be drawn, and if you, that is only New York, if you add San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, any city that had 2,000 people or more, it is, I don't know how many buildings, so it's a big bottleneck, it is slow process, so we figured out a way in a, in a, in a during a hackathon in 2013, uh, we, we, with collaboration with some uh, researchers, uh, whoops. Okay. Okay. 
so in collaboration with some researchers, um, we came up with a process that, that, that extracts uh, building polygons from these atlases. Uh, this is the URL to the code. And basically what it means is you go from here to here, right? This is the original map. This is the vectorized output. So you can tell that there are some, some buildings missing and some are not really buildings. I, I, some of there, you, you, you can tell that there are not buildings. But anyway, but it's pretty good, right? Yeah, up, up here, right? There are not buildings. But for the most part, it is pretty decent. Uh, this can produce 80,000 buildings in a day. Instead of waiting in three years, you get 80,000 buildings, and it's about 90% correct. So it is pretty good. But it's not perfect. You can tell, for example, in this one, I am not even showing the, the map, and you can tell that that is probably not a correct um, shape, and these are probably not buildings because they are too small. So the maps are old and, and dirty, so that could become a problem. So we came up with this uh, tool to have humans check the, 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 the shapes that the computer produces and tell us yes, correct, or no, it's not correct, or fix, it's almost correct, you just need a little fixing, right? It was to test, one, how good the output was, and two, um, if humans were willing to do this. And they, you have a little counter here, how many you have done, and you can share it on Twitter, you know, and it was quite popular. So what, this is a process of, of going we have a mountain of data that we need to go through and we cut it into little pieces, you know, so that it's easier to, to, for one human to do one polygon instead of doing 80,000. And if, if many people do it, then we get the job done. And we have all this data that we want to get out of these maps. So, uh, so we basically have to check all those polygons and those that are classified as yes, uh, we, we then have a new task that is give me the address number of this building or give me the color that tells me what type of building it is uh, and if it's a fix then fix it and then we can eventually send it to a yes task to get the rest of the data right and we ignore the ones that are no and we make a little task for each of those a little easy task and this is what it looks like um, on this side, we, can, we are getting the numbers. You, you are shown a building polygon, a building footprint, and you are to tell us what address number it is. In this one, you are asked to tell us which color the building is, uh, or in this one, in this case, you are fixing the building itself, moving, moving the, 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 the points around, or in this one, you are just telling us what names, what place names you see in the map, right? proper base names that we can then search against. Uh, over the past few years, we have had uh, 1,800,000 contributions. So that is, a yes is a contribution, a no, fix, one address number. You know, one person can make many contributions. This is not the amount of people that have been participating. In reality is a few thousand people have contributed me a million times. And this is how, what it looks like now uh, for the new set. We have Manhattan and Brooklyn from the 1850s. And this is the, how the polygons look, the detail of that. So it's pretty high quality uh, polygons. And so now we have two sets, right? We have the old one and the new one. This one took three years. This one took a few months to produce, right? Uh, so, if we could add this uh, to all, all the other, we have Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan and, and, and Bronx, Staten Island, and, you know, this could be scaled very easily. Uh, the URL is that one, building inspector that uh, This is a few datas, data points, this is only from the place names people write. So these are the 11 most popular place names. Uh, the most popular one being church, uh, but yeah, bank or factory, right? Uh, so it, it, this is all the drugstores in Manhattan. For some reason, they go 
north of this line. I don't know why. Churches are all over the place. Banks in the financial district, or what we know now as the financial district, originally had all the banks. Uh, the, the hotels are up Broadway. Uh, breweries are like concentrated in these like, areas. And distilleries for whiskey, right, in those areas. Some interesting patterns. So uh, the, this project was interesting for the National Library of France and they are uh, trying to use it for, for uh, uh, France a country level atlas they have, they want to start fixing some shapes, not buildings but just general uh, neighborhood level uh, polygons. Uh, and so, but we are only talking about atlases here, right? Only maps, but there is geographic data contained. So with, with these maps, so this is just a little animation I made of all the, uh, an example of maps that are just of Manhattan. And, and we can like go back in time and forward just, if you just use maps, there is a lot of information that you can, that you can start exploring. But geographic data is present in other materials. We have, um, they don't have to be in, in, in map form. For example, we have city directories, just names, occupations, and addresses of people, like the phone book, but without telephones because there were no telephones. Um, or we have a, a directory of automobiles. So anybody who had a car in New York was here, and they had the brand of the car, the, the license plate, uh, I don't know what this, the engine number, uh, the name of the person and the address, so we know who has a car where, part, but part of the city. We also have brewery uh, directories, so uh, like the addresses and, and loca the locations of places that make beer. Uh, and we have the maps where those breweries appear, right? So there are drawings of, of, of how the brewery looked like back in the day. And if you can see what that special, that, that play, place looks like right now, it's just some apartment building. And so we would like to connect everything, right? To, to make everything searchable, not only maps, right? So this is a, a, the project that we call Space Time, where you would have a query and you would get all the places that are related to that query and you could make it even more specific to a time period and get all the material else we have from that from that query and export it and do whatever you want with it right and anybody could be able to build a similar time machine uh, for their city so it's called the space time that's the URL and it's still very experimental so if you go there are some links to websites but they may work uh, or not right but that it's an exploration that we are doing uh, so because we one of some of the material that we have is uh, menus. We have restaurant menus, and the menus have locations, right? So we are trying to locate those menus somewhere in the map. Uh, we have photographs. So this is another tool that lets somebody who knows a little bit about the photograph can do some research and locate the, the, the photograph somewhere in the map. Because the, the first step is producing the data that then you can connect to each other. Or in this case, uh, this is oral histories, uh, audio, where people mention places and we want to put those places uh, so that when you hear the audio you can maybe know what place it's talking about or you can find the audio by the place that is being mentioned. Or in the metadata of this image there is this text, somebody, a librarian, described this image and we want to get all the building names, all the place names from those images. This is code that, that we are publishing continuously in, in this website and you can download and use however you want. They, they are very specific tasks for each code snippet and we also have data sets that you can download in several formats from the, the consolidation that we are doing constantly on the data I just mentioned. And this is the GitHub repository. Uh, this is the GitHub organization that has all the repositories 
And this is an example of what you can do once you have all the data connected. So these are all the maps that we have in our collection of a certain level of resolution, like street level resolution that we have uh, for, for the area around New York City uh, over the decades. So from, you know, so you can tell that we have acquired a lot more maps over time and the maps cover a larger area of, of Manhattan. And, or this is another example made by, these are all made by Bert Spann, my colleague, this is his um, Twitter handle also. Um, where he maps all the all the maps that we have from the Hudson River uh, in, a, in our collection. This is the Hudson River, it's a very important river in the history of New York. <coughs> so you, you, you can uh, click around and get all the maps uh, of the area you clicked in. And this is just a little toy where you, you see every single map in, a, in one page and you can find which maps are missing and you can click and help us fix that. Thank you very much for giving the presentation. Uh, a pretty couple of the most credible, a very much more important. I didn't want to be a little Thanks to the Knight Foundation, we had a grant 
So we have a lot of grant-based projects, and that one, the Knight Foundation uh, put the money for the space-time directory to be to have it. Right? So it's not library budget itself. The, How many uh, researchers are hired in that library? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the thing is, the library has many ways of supporting research. So we have one one project called the Coleman Center, where um, where uh, writers that have a contract can come and for free use uh, an office space. They have office and a desk and all the research material they want for the duration of their contract and they can write. And many important books have been produced out of that center. Uh, very famous, uh, uh, maybe in the geo community, you know, um, The Power Broker of Robert Moses, a book about Robert Moses, a famous uh, urbanist, very controversial. Uh, Robert Caro wrote that book in the Coleman Center, I believe. But there, there's the Coleman Center, the Wertheim Center, there are others in, in, in the Library of Performing Arts. So, like, I don't know how many are being uh, employed in my team. We were at some point four or five people. So, and we are not really called researchers, we are just extracting data out of the, the materials. Thank you for great presentation. Um, uh, I cannot speak English, so please <laughs> translate. Uh, <laughs> Morita? Eto. 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 Especially, is uh, you said uh, uh, there are there were many contributions from the, all over the world. How uh, did you promote uh, to get uh, the material and contributions? Uh, the way how to do uh, in like the very first version of building inspector was yes no fix only. Right, and it was a very different website than what you see today. It is very different, it's very simple, very bad design. Right, yeah, but just did yes, no fix. It did <laughs> yes, no fix, good, but the rest was not important. Yes, no fix, and and the tweet, you could tweet, and it had the number, your score. Um, that was promoted mostly via social media, in Twitter things like that and there was also like a, a news article in Wired, in Wired Maps in the website and uh, some other news organizations picked up on that and so mo mostly digital uh, social media right other projects that we've done have had more high profile a promotion like in the New York Times or things like that but, but this one was very um, like low budget let's say zero budget just Twitter you, we tweet and then people retweet and, and then there's this little the score you people can tweet the score and that's a link so so there's some viral aspect to it so sounds sound like very efficient promotion Yes, yes, very yes. No <laughs> uh,
secret or some kind of privacy or asset uh, belong to that age of people. Uh, how did you hold that kind of program? Yes, yeah, so, so privacy is a big issue. It's, a big, it's an important aspect of what we do. We are uh, more eager to surface this data because it is 150 years old. So everybody involved probably died already. Uh, uh, but yeah, but that is a genuine problem. As you, as you get closer to the present, something like this is a little more complicated. Right, uh, so that is a, a, a question we ask ourselves and we, we, we need to keep in mind and everybody needs to keep in mind because in theory, uh, like open data is good and all that, right? But then you're talking about people's addresses and that you can search and very easily find everything they, are, they appear. So, so, so yes, for example, one of our there, there is an embargo in, so the, the United States does a census every 10 years, right? It goes around, asks questions, where do you live, what's your name, occupation, uh, everything, how many kids you have, uh, to have a demographic picture of the, of the country. But they don't release that data that they release aggregated version of that data. They know how many people are Hispanic, how many people are black, how many people are white, how many, right? How many people come from what country? Uh, after 72 years, that data is published. So in 2012 was the 72nd anniversary of the 1940 census. And, and so, so there are embargo periods. So I guess it would be a matter of Kind of, that, that 72 years could be a good, a reasonable uh, uh, period of, of distance from the present to start working with historical materials. And also when releasing data, making sure that it's segregated or, I mean, keeping in mind the privacy problem of, of, of what we're working with. Thank you very much for 